Sorry for the delay, I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Um, internet issues, obviously. Um, so I was, before I realised we actually uh, had a hiccup in our stream, I was talking about Highland Cartilage uh, and um, the matrix of Highland Cartilage. So this is the matrix of Highland Cartilage. It's made up of predominantly water, 80% or more of the volume of uh, Highland Cartilage matrix is water, and also made up of type 2 collagen. Um, which is the predominant protein type uh, amongst there. Cells make up about 3 to 5% of the volume of hyaline cartilage. Um, so here you can actually see the sort of junction between uh, the hyaline cartilage and then the mineralized bone. Uh, so remembering when I was talking about endochondral ossification, which is the way in which bones form, they start off as this hyaline cartilage model and then eventually they get replaced by bone. Um, when that happens, we end up with these little zones of remnant cartilage. And one of those zones is the articular cartilage on the surface. So that matrix, that, that model of hyaline cartilage eventually gets replaced by bone and you end up with just a little cap of hyaline cartilage on the top. And this is what this represents here. So this is sort of the demarcation between the uh, hyaline cartilage of the articular cartilage and then the, the bone matrix down here. So it's mineralized all the way to this line and this is the junction uh, between uh, the hyaline cartilage matrix here and then the mineralized um, bone matrix out here. So here's our osteocytes uh, here and here's our chondrocytes sitting in within their lacuna uh, out here. So they both sit within lacuna uh, except that this is cartilage matrix and this is bone matrix, mineralized bone matrix. So if we zoom out here, um, so this is actually spongy bone. You can see it's quite irregular in shape. So we refer to these as either bony spicules or trabeculae. Um, so um, spongy bone has those names. Um, and they're characterized by being lined by a layer of endosteum, which consists of osteoblasts. So osteoblasts sit on the surface, but we can also find osteoclasts and osteoprogenitor cells or stem cells that are gonna go on to form osteoblasts a bit later. Um, so we zoom around, we can have a look at some of these um, and I'll see if I can find a, a few examples of some, um, yeah, here's a nice osteoclast. This, you can tell osteoclasts because they're very large and um, they have these multi, uh, multiple nuclei in their cytoplasm here. So that's an osteoclast and osteoclasts are responsible for digesting bone and, and bone modification. And they're particularly responsive to the hormone, parathyroid hormone. Um, which is uh, released in low blood calcium uh, levels. And then that stimulates the osteoclasts uh, to digest the bone, and then that releases the calcium back into the bloodstream, and then that raises the blood calcium levels. Now this odd structure here, uh, which is kind of cool, you see this sort of these bands, we've got this articular cartilage here, we've got the spongy bone here with the bone marrow in between, and then we've got this band of pale blue tissue. What is this? Well, this is actually a structure known as the epiphyseal growth plate. It's within the epiphysis of the bone, which is the head of the bone, and it represents the cartilage growth plate. So when you grow, you, this growth plate lays down new cartilage, and then that cartilage gets replaced by bone. So that way you actually get taller. So this um, animal that this section was taken from it was in the process of growing. And we have all these different zones related to cartilage growth. So there's lots of mitosis coming through. Thank you for the, the cool cat there, Dr. Crane. Um, we've got these plates of, of uh, chondrocytes here uh, undergoing mitosis. And then they get really, really big, um, like, like me after a, a night of fish and chips. Um, big fat cells. Um, and they, these are known as um, hypertrophic zone. G'day Derek, how are you going? Welcome to the stream. Um, so these are high, this is the hypertrophic zone where the cells have expanded a lot. What's happening is down at the bottom here, we can see this darker blue material. This is actually mineralized cartilage. And min once it becomes mineralized, there's no more diffusion possible in this matrix. So uh, we lose diffusion. These cells lose their supply of oxygen and nutrients. Um, and they actually um, begin to degrade. And eventually these spaces will form these spaces here that eventually will be lined by endosteum and then eventually the matrix that remains behind 
will be the new bone tissue. That'll be the format upon which the new bone gets added. So you can see here, you can see these dark bands on the outside and then the pale band. So this is the cartilage matrix and that's the remnant cartilage matrix and the new bone tissue is being added to the surface of that old cartilage. So we've got um, here, we've got um, these surfaces lined by the endosteum. So these are the osteoblasts. Um, and then we've got blood vessels in this region as well. Lots of blood vessels related to the uh, bone marrow itself. Um, so those are some of the major features which we can see here. What might be nice now is to actually look at a, a section of uh, dried compact bone. So I'm gonna go back um, to our slide box, go to our demonstration slides here. So please bear with me while um, these take a little while to, to pop up. Um, yeah, a little bit like the Truman Show. Um, and we'll search for here, our ground bone. It's bone which was found on the ground. No, actually it means that because it was hard, you actually have to um, ground that section rather than section it with a normal histology. So this is all dead tissue. This is the remnant, the extracellular matrix, what's left behind of, of compact bone. Um, and uh, compact bone is, um, has the main feature of having these circular arranged structures. And these are known as osteons or herversion systems. And they're characterized by having this central canal here, uh, which is known as the um, herversion canal um, of an osteon. Now, normally in living tissue, this would be lined by um, uh, endosteum. So we would find endosteum there. So we'd find osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteoprogenitor cells, but also found within the herversion canal uh, would be blood vessels. And these will be supplying nutrients to our osteocytes. Now, we can see here, now for those of you who have arachnophobia or if they're um, insects, Please bear with me. These do look a little bit like spiders or ants or something like that. Um, this, this region here, this represents the lacuna where the osteocyte used to exist. Um, and then these little, these little leg-like structures, and I, I, I'll see if I can um, zoom in a little bit here on one of these. We'll sort of put this over here. So um, let's zoom in. Right, so this is sort of the body region. This is the... Um, lacuna, and then these little leg-like structures. These are the little canals within which the osteocyte uh, cell processes used to run. And so these are known as canaliculi. And so you can see this is making connection with the blood vessels which would have been existing within the Haversian canal. And then this actually makes connection with the adjacent um, osteocyte through these gap, junct gap junctions forming between the adjacent cytoplasmic processes within these canaliculi. So they actually form this really cool network. We have these rings of bone tissue called lamella. These are called um, circumferential lamella here. Um, sorry, these are called um, haversian lamella or concentric lamella. And then these um, osteocytes, uh, the lacuna, are found at sort of the junctions between adjacent lamella. Look at these big long canaliculi which would have connected um, these osteocytes together so it can get nutrients and pass on waste and so on. It's a big network of these uh, cells all interconnecting with each other. Now, if we zoom out a little bit, um, we can see multiple osteons, okay? These are the active osteons. What's found in between, these are known as interstitial lamellae, and these are actually old osteons which have been remodeled. So here you can actually see this used to be an osteon, but there's no more Haversian canal. It's actually been remodeled, um, and so it no longer has a Haversian canal there. So the interstitial lamellae are found in between the osteons, and they represent the old osteons which have been remodeled. Um, we do find other lamellae, um, not always this evident, evident in, in sections like this, but um, on the outer surface adjacent to the periosteum, we can find outer circumferential lamellae, and then on the inside near the medullary cavity, we can find inner circumferential lamellae. Now, another really cool fact about these lamellae is that the collagen fibers that make up each lamellae are running in different directions. So for example, the collagen fibers within this lamella may be running uh, this way, and then in this lamellae, they may be running in an opposite direction. So they alternate between adjacent lamellae. And um, 
that actually gives them a strength. It's kind of like having a dense irregular connective tissue but in a mineralized form. So they're able to withstand forces from many different directions by having this variant uh, orientation of their collagen fibers. So sometimes you can actually see how some of these uh, haversian canals are actually connected to each other by these perforating canals. These perforating canals are also known as Balkman's canals. So the haversian canals run parallel to the length of the bone. The perforating canals run uh, perpendicular to the length of the bone. Um, so you can actually sometimes see here, for example, here's a perforating canal which would have been lined by endosteum as well. So we might have a look now at some of the uh, different types of cartilage. Um, no worries, James, thanks very much for sticking around. Um, I'm probably gonna be ending the stream really soon um, because of course this was just a test and we thought we'd see how we go. Um, hopefully we found it successful and we can move forward to having more regular streams uh, of histology and we can get some of the students on board. Um, well, we may actually end the stream there unless anyone um, is actually present. <laughs> I don't think anyone other than James is present, but um, if anyone else is present, then um, please say hello, and if you've got any questions, ask a question. Otherwise, uh, we may be uh, ending the stream. Um, so uh, hopefully that was a successful test. Um, we can find out at another stage um, uh, whether this is a viable option to, to try to teach students. Uh, histology and then as I said James and I are hoping to um, work together to actually um, create an anatomy and physiology stream um, and we're hoping to have these um, weekly streams um, one on histology called histology 101 which is what this is a test of and then um, anatomy and physiology which is to be named um, and we are still learning the system so please bear with us as we um, uh, try to learn this material here Alright, so um, I really appreciate your time to come in to visit this um, stream, this test stream. Um, uh, thank you very much to the University of Tasmania for allowing us to um, try this method of learning um, and uh, learning support for our students. Um, I think it's kind of cool. Um, hopefully students will find it interesting as well. And um, yeah, so maybe we'll see you next time. We'll put up a schedule and we can have a chat about um, what you'd like to see. So that's it for now. Uh, thanks very much. We really appreciate you coming along and we'll see you in the next stream.